Welcome everyone and welcome to the Meta Centre for a very special event, a Mind Lab workshop. So today we are in for a treat because we have a host of speakers joining us in person at the Meta Centre in Sydney, as well as also virtually from around the world. We have Venerable Amadasana and also Venerable Dasa. And not only do we have one, but we have three Anagarikas joining us for a panel discussion today. Ooh. So today we will be exploring how to bring Buddhism into our life and hear about the lives of the monastics and also Anagarikas. We will have presentations, guided meditation, Q&A sessions, and also lots of discussions as well. So to get the most out of today, we do invite you to join us for an interactive session and meet with also other people at the event as well during our breaks. So that includes those online as well. We have not forgotten you. So when we get to that, I'll let you know what we'll do. So anyway, settle in and let's do a deep dive into the Mind Lab. <laughs> so to start off the program today, we will invite Venerable Dasa Tero for a talk on the practical application of Dhamma. Venerable Dasa is a highly ordained Buddhist monk, giving talks across the globe, particularly to the youth such as in Canada, UK, USA, and of course, in Australia now. He just finished his visiting different states in Australia. He's helped children and young adults with their stress, anxiety, depression, relationship problems, addictions, which just sounds like our life, doesn't it? <laughs> so, Venerable Dessa will, has gave a talk last year at the Meta Centre in November, and his talk was really relevant and there was great analogies. I still remember some great stories as well. So we are so happy that he's back again. So please join me as we welcome Venerable Dessa to give this presentation. Can you all see the black screen? Yeah. Perfect. So today, uh, well, I'm going to talk about happiness, but it's going to be different, hopefully, because what we all know is that we want to be happy. Right? So. Let me tell you why you're here. You know something, but you can't explain it, but you can feel it. You felt it your entire life. There's something wrong with this world, and you know it, but you don't know it, but it's there. It's like a splinter in your mind, driving you crazy. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you know what it is? Do you want to know what it is? It's everywhere. It's all around us. Even now, in this room. It's there. You can see it when you look out the window. When you turn on the television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go out. When you... You don't want to pay your taxes. It's the world that's been pulled over our eyes to blind us from the truth. What is the truth? Is that we are sleeping. We, like, just like everyone else, we are born into the bondage. We're in a prison that we cannot smell, taste, or touch. The prison for our mind.
Let me ask you. After this moment, there's no turning back. Zip. Take the blue pill. And story ends here. You wake up in your bed. And you can do it and you'll believe whatever you want to do. Take the red pill. You can stay in one of the you can stay in the wonderland. And I'll show you how deep the rubber hole goes. But remember, all I'm offering is the truth. Nothing more. So which one do you want to take? The blue or the red? Just like uh, Morpheus says to Neo in the Matrix, we decided to take the red pill. Okay. So my question is, we all want to be happy, but what do we do? What is it that we do for happiness? To go out, listen to music, watch TV, eat ice cream, and do all these things in search, in search for this happiness. Now, one wise man once said, if you had one hour to save the world, how will you spend your hour? He replied, he'll spend 55 minutes defining the problem and then five minutes solving it, says the great man, Albert Einstein himself. So what is this problem that we have? What is this problem that we want to solve? We have to first take time to define it. So we're looking for happiness, right? We're searching for happiness. Question is, are you satisfied? The way we search for happiness, does it bring the satisfaction? Does it bring us the satisfaction that we're looking for? For example, it's like last time you asked, how much chocolate do we need to be satisfied? Can chocolate actually satisfy us? To answer this question, all we have to do is look back in the past. Okay, how much chocolate have we eaten so far? Each and every one of us has probably eaten tons, a metric ton of chocolate by now. And for the rest of our lives, how much chocolate would you think we need? Again, more than a metric ton. We had, we're still in search, looking for this happiness. We go out, we eat chocolate, looking for this happiness. But no matter what, not satisfied. The amount of hours we have to listen to to be satisfied. Listening to music, can we be satisfied? When when was the last time you thought, okay, I'm only gonna listen to just one more song and that's it. Enough. That that's it. Full stop. Ever? Listen to song after song after song. Day in, day out. Never have we been satisfied. Movies. I can't remember uh, if, uh, if this is true, but I remember someone telling me that I think every two minutes, a new movie is released. Why is that? It's not satisfied. We've never been satisfied. We're continuously in search. And we search. We ask others and we search. Now, my question is, my question is, let's say, let's say you had a problem. 
Let's say a math problem. Right? Who would you turn to for the answer? Who would you turn to for the answer? Like when I show you this picture, who, who is the teacher and who is the student? Who's the teacher and who's the student? Of course, the adult must be the teacher and the child has to be the student. Why? Because we automatically think, okay, the adult knows the answer. The adult already knows the answer, therefore, he can be the teacher. The child doesn't know. Therefore, he's a student or she's a student. So let's say you have a math problem. I don't know, some, some complex math problem, right? So the father, let's say he has a PhD in maths. He's got a PhD in maths and he, he's, he's done so much in maths. And say the little girl is only five years old. Who would you go to to get the answer? Five-year-old, right? Yes. She knows the answer, right? Well, we, we turn straight to the PhD in mathematics to solve the most day, because you know he can solve the most complex problems. Right? And he'll give you, and you know, he'll give you the right answer. You know that. Right? Because we're smart. We're smart to know that, but are we smart enough to ask the same question about our happiness? Are we smart enough to ask the same question about our happiness? Because... because we ask people, okay, what do you do to be happy? But never do we actually realize, do we ask them if they have the qualification of happiness, that they are happy doing what they're doing. They are satisfied doing what they're doing. We never ask them that. We just look, we see them smile, we assume that they're happy, and we think if they do this to be happy, we must do the same thing to be happy. So, for example, you're walking on the street and you see, a, uh, you see a billboard with someone eating a burger with a smile on their face. What do we think? Burger, smile. Smile, burger. That means burgers should make me happy. And we don't ask, we just think, fine. If I eat this burger, I will be satisfied. But are we satisfied? Is the person in the billboard satisfied? We never look for that qualification. We never look and ask them, excuse me, <laughs> excuse me, billboard. <laughs> if I actually have this burger, will I be happy? Will I actually be satisfied? We never take a moment to ask. We just assume. If you remember when we were little, we would go up to our parents and ask our parents, okay, when I grow up, what should I be? Parents, um, and my parents were like, you know what? I remember when I was, I think, seven, my dad told me to be a pilot. Okay, and I asked him, okay, why, why, why should I be a pilot? You know what? Pilots, they fly in the sky. They can go to other countries. They're, they're happy. And so I remember thinking, right, if pilots are happy, then if I want to be happy, I must be a pilot. So we what? We learned. And then I remember my friends were showing me a video of a plane crash. And I was like, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. Pilots also found happiness. Don't want to be a pilot. And then I remember asking this, my friend, Okay, what do you want to be? He said, you know, I, I, I know someone who's an engineer. You can be an engineer. No, no. He actually said before that, you know what? You can become a doctor. Okay, doctor it is. And I worked hard. Then I found, <laughs> and then I remember once, I think I fell down and uh, had an accident, went to the hospital. Uh, and I think I, went around the hospital and I slipped into the ICU. I think that was the worst mistake I've done in my life. I thought, doctor, no. 
too much trauma. And then I remember asking another person, okay, what should you do? What do you want to be? An engineer. Okay. So engineers, if, if, if you're happy and you're an engineer, that means if I want to be happy, I do, must do what? Be an engineer. But never do we take a moment and ask them, excuse me, engineer, are you actually happy? Are you truly happy? Is there, is there nothing else that's, is there something in your life that's making you unhappy? Because I remember once uh, I, I went up to one of my teachers and asked, uh, my school teachers and asked them, Miss, are you happy? I said, yeah, I'm pretty happy because I teach my students and do all this. But then I asked her, well, when so-and-so says something rude, doesn't that make you unhappy? Yeah. Like, do you enjoy marking our homework? No. Why do you set us homework? Like, and you really ask them, well, they're not happy. But we just assume. We assume that this is this is it. They are happy. We must do it. Now, we have to first realize what is our happiness? What is happiness? So, I have something that probably most of you will, 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 will like. Okay. Chocolate cake. Okay, that's how it goes. Put your hand up if you enjoy chocolate cake. Enjoy eating chocolate cake. <laughs> that was so well. <laughs> I just finished on it. For the right audience. <laughs> okay, okay. So, well, when we were born, did we know that chocolate cake will make us happy? Did we know that? So the moment you were born and you're like you're, you're a baby in your mom's hand, in your mom's hands, did you think, you know what, I want chocolate? This was something that, of course, you were told. You were shown. Someone had to introduce you to chocolate. So I remember the first time I had ice cream. And I remember, first of all, being really scared. Ice cream's cold. And I remember, like, when I licked it for the first time, it froze my tongue. And I didn't like it. But then my friend said, well, that's the point. It's supposed to be cold. I thought, okay. <laughs> then if it's supposed to be cold, then I should like this. And eventually, okay, licked all of it, finished it. And I thought, okay, ice cream, should make that. Ice cream makes me happy. So someone had to introduce us. Like that, someone had to introduce us to a cake. And now what we feel is that cake makes us happy. Right? So if we really think about it, technically, if cake makes us happy, the more slices of, or more pieces of cake we eat, the happier we should be, right? So it should be like this. I eat 1,000 cake. <laughs> I should be 1,000 happy. Is that the case? It's more like this. You have the first, second cake. Okay. Afterwards, you drop. The more the cake, the more unhappy. Like near, the, near the bottom, that's where you get diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> so, wait. Then cake should have happiness. Should it not? Because when we eat cake, we are happy. When we eat cake, we are happy. So cake should have happiness. But this is otherwise. This says that, okay, there must be something else, but not physical cake, but something else that makes us happy. So why is cake? Actually makes us happy.
on this cake actually makes us happy? What in this cake actually makes us happy? Is it something inside the cake? Honestly, when you see this, does that not make you happy? Just seeing the cake, just seeing cake, does that not make you happy? So before you had your cake, well, are you not happy to see cake? Well, yeah, because it's cake. And let's say I have this cake in front of me, right? Being, being a good person, I decide, you know what, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, six, one, two, us. I decide to cut this cake in 20 pieces, right? And give you a slice. Right. You're happy. Receiving the slice of cake makes you happy. Agree? Let's say we hand out spoons and forks and we're all going to eat it, right? Together. Right? We'll take our spoons and our forks, we dig in, and we put it in our mouths, and we find out that this is not real. This is made of wax. The cake we're eating is wax. But yet, we found happiness in just looking at the cake. We found happiness in just looks. See the cake? Does that not make you happy? Well, that's wax. It's not real. But yet it makes us happy. So what in this cake actually makes it happy? What really in this cake makes it happy? Is it cake that makes us happy? Now, this is what I mean. You took the red pill. I'm sorry. It's your fault. <laughs> what is this? Oh, stop. I mean, what is this? Yeah, how much do you think it costs? Approximately. Uh, the, <laughs> the, the real one the real one costs 860 million right so let's say somehow you had enough money right and you have nothing else to do with your life you decide yes i'm gonna buy the money <laughs> I have nothing else to do with my life, right? <laughs> I'm excited. I'm going to buy this money and stuff. So you buy it. You hang it on, 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 on one of your walls. And every day you go up to it and you stare at it. But then you hear that this is the real money stuff. What you have is a fraud. Then you spend 680 million on a floor. But I mean, that, that's the real one. And that, that's the fake one. What difference is it? What difference can you see? But can you see something different? Uh, I don't know. This one and the old one. This is the new, so this is this is the, the original. Original. Hmm. Hey, what's the difference you can see? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Wow. The fraud now costs zero. It's worthless. <laughs> you take it, you throw it straight in the trash. It's fraud, it's fake. Unless you're going to do something else. What else are you going to do with it? Are you going to somebody else to give you money back? <laughs> But the person sold it said no, no time, no refunds. So wait, zero. Then you again here, wait. 
we made a mistake. That was the real one. The real one. Now, how much does that cost? Wait, so the value went from 860 million to zero and back up to 860 million. How is that possible? How is that possible? I mean, it was the same picture throughout, but it went from 860 million to zero and back up. And you were, so <laughs> imagine you actually bought the Mona Lisa. You put it on a wall and you'd be staring at it and you'd be looking at it and you'd be so happy that you bought it. But the moment you find out it's a fake or you thought it's a fake, now does that give you happiness? Now, does that make you happy in any sort of way? You, you, should, you just threw it in the rubbish. Threw it in the bin. You didn't think twice, you just threw it away. But then you realize, no, it's the real one. And now you go back and you hang it back onto the wall. And now you were so happy looking at it. So there's a problem there, isn't there? That's a big problem because the value that we see, that we feel, isn't actually in an object, is it? It's something that we feel, that we place. Now I want to go back to our chocolate cake. So we like cake. So what's, what is it that actually makes us happy? It isn't the painting. It isn't the cake. Then what really is it that makes us happy? Because the value wasn't in the painting. The, the, the happiness wasn't in the cake. Then where did the happiness or, the, or, or this, you know, this value come from? Doesn't it show you that this is all something that goes inside, internal? That value and that, that beauty. I remember once actually thinking, why, why do people spend so much money to look at the Mona Lisa? It's, a, oh, it's not there, but it'll be there. Hold up. Uh, it just looks like a normal drawing to me. Like you could take a photograph better than this. Why do people spend, like literally will go all the way to France to look at, at this painting? So they say beauty is in the what? I am the beholder. One person will find one thing beautiful, the other person will not. It depends on the object or depends on the person. So, okay, that means our happiness is internal. Our happiness is all internal. So, if our happiness is internal, that means we should be able to control it, right? Because this outside factor is just, it isn't something that affects it. It's inside. If it's inside, we should be able to control it, right? Well, at first we have to realize, we have to understand, okay, how? How does happiness work? What is the science behind it? What, what is it, what's behind it that makes us happy? Now, if you think about it, what is it that makes us happy? It really wasn't the kid. Instead, it was that you wanted the kid. You wanted the cake. Therefore, right, the feeling of want, what would you place it? Would you place it as a very positive feeling? Like you say, I have cake, but I say, no, you can't have cake. Is wanting a positive feeling here? Wanting is a fire that burns inside. Because now you want it. I want cake. I want cake. I want cake. No. You feel that, okay. I want cake, which creates a pressure that builds up inside, right? It's a pressure that builds up inside. And then when you receive it, it's relief. 
the pressure is relieved. And therefore you think, wow, I'm so happy about that. I'm happy. For example, if I was to ask you, how valuable do you think the money is? Like, say this is the first time you've seen this, this picture, this painting. How valuable do you think it is? If it's, the, if it's your first time, you'll think, okay, uh, you'll give it a random price. Because <laughs> I remember learning arts uh, in school. We, I once remember seeing a picture of literally a paint, paint splatter. Some you know, artist got a paint and splattered it on, on the canvas. And that sold for over a million. And I thought, wait, wait, wait. How? How can that be so, so expensive? My little sister can be better than that. But... The reason why we say this is very expensive is because of this relief we get. Because this is rare. Because of this story that's built up behind it. For example, no one knows who this person is. Still. They say that this is actually three paintings on top of each other. I don't know. There, there are hundreds of theories. I can't, I can't remember more. Like you can't say whether she's smiling or frowning. Half of her smiling, half of her, fun. and because of the mystery behind it, it's very expensive. Not the painting, but the feeling behind it. It's not the painting, but the feeling that we have behind it. And the happiness that we get is because of the relief from the pressure that we have. For example, I say, okay, no Mona Lisa, you're not allowed to see her. And then once I show it to you, you think, wow. Because we're constantly in search of beauty. Constantly in search of beauty. So when we find it, we're happy. Not because of the beauty, but because it relieves our pressure. All of our happiness is like that. Every single time we feel happy, it's because of this relief and pressure. I mean, that we talked about last time as well. So, we go back to Einstein's quote. If you have an hour to save the world, I will spend that hour. I'll spend 55 minutes defining the problem and five minutes solving it. So what is the actual problem? Okay, I want something. You can place whatever you want. For example, I want to be complimented. I want a new uh, phone. I want to be, I want to uh, say, talk to someone, right? But I don't have. So say, for example, I want a new phone, but I don't have a phone. Hmm? Therefore, I'm happy. Right? But every single time, the problem that we see is, it's because I don't have. So uh, I, I don't have a new phone. So what do I need to do? I need to get a new phone. I don't, I don't have uh, the, I don't have chocolate. I don't have chocolate cake. So what do I do? I go out and buy it. But really, that's not the problem. The problem is not with that or that. The problems with this, I want. So it's, it's almost like this. It's almost like there's a massive fire on, on the ground floor of a building, right? And you're on the first floor. You see a small flame somewhere, and you take your fire extinguisher and you extinguish the small flame. You have a massive fire on the ground floor. Everything is destroyed. But on the first floor, you just see a small, you see some smoke. And you think, okay, I must close my window now. That's what we've been doing. That's what we've been doing our entire life. We've kept the actual fire. And we've been looking to, to 
get rid of the smoke. It's like this, right? Let's say you're sick. Let's say you're sick. You have a headache, you have a cough, and you have a stomachache. What, how do you medicate yourself? I have a headache. So, you, so you're very ill, so you have a headache. For the headache, I'm gonna say some paracetamol. I have a cough. For the cough, I must take a cough answer. I have a stomachache. So, so uh, I have to take this medicine for that. For as long as you, so if you kept treating the symptoms, when will the disease disappear? When will you become well? Let's say your immune system isn't work. When will your, when will, when will this illness disappear? So you have a headache. Every time you feel a headache, you just take some paracetamol. Every time you have a cough, you just take the cough syrup. When inside there's a bacteria, inside there's a virus, say bacteria. For as long as there's a bacteria, you're going to be sick. So what do you have to do? You have to solve the correct problem, the core problem. You have to just take antibiotics. And that's it. You have to take cough syrup and paracetamol and stomach uh, medicine for your stomach ache for your entire life from the start to the very end. But how long do you have to take the antibiotic? The course, uh, a month course. You complete the course and then done. This is the virus, this is the bacteria. I want. That is what has been what has been inside of us, and that is what we've never seen to be the problem. Because when something happens, we automatically think, "No, it's because I don't have it. It's because it's not working. Because I because it's not working to the way I expect." We've never thought it's because I want something. The best way to put this is that's nice. This is the first time doing with slides, so exactly. <laughs> We're at a football game. Right. Watching it, I don't remember any teams. Do you guys know any teams? Football teams? Uh, soccer teams. Anyone? Chelsea versus so that's blue, right? Chelsea's blue. Right? Maybe? Don't know. Chelsea uh, versus Manchester. I mean, Manchester's red, right? Okay. So, we've got Chelsea versus Manchester. Okay. Now, here's the thing. Let's say half of you say this half of the room supports Chelsea. This half supports Manchester. Right? Now, I want you to take a bird's eye view of the game. So take it very uh, objectively, right? There's a ball. The ball is kicked around. When the ball moves to one side, when a ball, spherical object, moves to one side of this pitch, half of you are cheering. The half of you, another half of you are doing. It moves to the other side of the pitch. This half is now, is now screaming with joy. The other half is now doing it. When this spherical object enters a rectangular thingy, half of you are screaming with joy, the other half are crying with sadness. When it goes the other way, the opposite. Way. Now, throughout the entire game, both teams are what? Both teams are under the pressure. Who's going to win? Is it going to be Chelsea? Is it going to be was that team? Manchester. Which side? Who's going to win? Who's going to win? And you're constantly under pressure. For, for example, which games, which, food, which soccer game truly makes us like really happy? So unfortunately, uh, back in the UK, I used to live near 
a football stadium, a soccer stadium. So you can guess the results after the game. So I wasn't a soccer fan, but because I, I live in the stadium, I probably could guess the, the, the results. You know, where, when, when the crowd is cheering and parading through, through uh, the streets, yeah, they parade. Every, every time there's a match, there's a parade. Uh, if it's a big parade, you know, the scores were nick and nick, and at the last moment, someone scored. You know, they're going to celebrate, they're going to they're gonna have a party. Right, which you won't be able to go to sleep until 12 midnight. You know, if it isn't that, if they're not celebrating as much, everyone expected the results that say Chelsea was definitely going to win. Therefore, they're not celebrating as much, so we can guess, okay. We can guess the results by how they celebrate. So the games that bring them the most amount of happiness is when the game was so close, nil-nil, and in the last couple of minutes, someone scores. So is it the scoring that makes them happy, or is it that because of the relief, not pressure, that makes them happy? It's that relief from the pressure that makes them happy. It isn't, it isn't the scoring. Scoring is the, only the trigger. But the actual happiness comes from that relief. So no matter what, no matter the results, right? If you had, if you had wanted a team to win, you were under pressure. Now let's say you brought along a friend, right? You forced one of your best friends over. So it's almost like someone forced you to come, right? Now you don't support either side. Chelsea, uh, Manchester, don't know. Now this spherical object moves one side. Moves the other side. Goes through the rectangle. Goes through the other rectangle. Chelsea wins. Manchester wins. The game, it, it starts like raining heavily, the game gets cancelled. The results don't matter anymore. You can stay your happy self without the, the results. Don't depend on it. It's not dependent on anything. Your happiness is with, it's with you and it's not dependent. That is why I want is the problem here. I want is the virus, is the bacteria. We have to get rid of I want. And then your fears, the fear of who's going to win, the anxious, the stress thing. I know, especially in the UK, soccer is a very big sport. So it is literally some for some people, it's almost like it's life and death. I mean, I, I some of my friends, that TV has been ruined several times because of the results. Now that's going that's going to extreme, but that's that's what happens even at the smallest level. This I want is what creates it. I want is what we have to get rid of. Now, the question is, okay, how? So, okay, I want the problem, right? Okay, so we'll, this, we'll do this, right? I'm gonna count to five, count to three, and I want you at on three to stop wanting. Ready? One, two, three. Can you? Is it possible? Stop wanting cake. Stop wanting uh, Chelsea to win. Stop wanting. Can you just stop wanting? Is that possible? Just, just. Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> you see, it's not you. You can't just. Why? Why is that? Because I want is a part of a process. It's a mind. It's a part of the process. Now, here's the thing. I want the way the real only reason why I want is a problem, right? Is because our mind has been hijacked by something else. Because if you really look at it, what is the actual purpose of the mind? What is the purpose of the mind? That's, what does the mind really do? Okay, so if I asked you, how do you know you're alive? What can you say? You can move, you can breathe, you can see, you can hear other people talking, you can smell, you can taste chocolate cake, you can feel, Right? And that's how we know we're alive. We only know we're alive because of our five, six senses, because we can think as well. Right? But tell me a moment when you're not doing either one of these six. One moment where you're not seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, or thinking. Now, sleep, well, while you're asleep, your mind is still pretty active. Tell me one moment in your life when you're doing when you're not doing either one of these six. When you're sleeping, your mind is like semi-active. It's like in a, in a drug state. But the rest of it, we're doing either one of these six. So if we ask ourselves, what is the role of a mind? What the mind does is takes input, processes. It gives an output. Pretty much. So we see a flower, we process it, and we give an output and say, okay, this is a flower. Smell it or go and do something. But the mind is hijacked. The mind is hijacked. And this comes up I want flower. I must have flower. Now we have to understand, okay, what hijacked the mind? What is it that hijacked the mind? What, what is it that has taken over our mind to make us sad? Because the mind's job isn't to make us unhappy. The mind's job is just input, process, output. So what is it that hijacked the mind? It is our ignorance. Ignorance of what, though? For as long as we thought, you know what? Chelsea is what, is, is gonna, is what makes me happy. We support Chelsea. For as long as you thought, Liverpool, uh, Manchester is what's going to make you happy. You think Manchester? I'm gonna support, I want Manchester. Today. For as long as you thought, you know what? Cake is what made me happy. You automatically think, okay, I want cake then. We always want something that makes us happy. Because of our ignorance, we thought that it was cake that made us happy. So almost our mind has is has is going in two directions. One of them is okay, you see cake, you process and you output, okay, it's cake. With another process, the hijack process, you think cake must have. I want cake. Because of this ignorance, that you thought that, you know, it's cake that made us happy. It is cake, not the relief from that pressure, but cake. Not only that, it's because you had thought that, you know what, this cake is cake. Meaning that this cake is not a changing, but just cake itself. Now, 
say some, some simple maths, right? Where's one plus one? <laughs> What's one plus one? Come on, we got this. What's one plus one? Are you sure about that? <laughs> one plus one. Okay, should be two. Whatever you want it. <laughs> it must be two, right? That's what we've learned, right? It's true. So if you had one stone, I'd put two, put another stone with it, and you have two stones. But is that what we feel? One plus one is two. Now, how many parts do you think you see? You can see parts? Right? So say there are say say hundred parts. So one plus one plus one plus one plus one go on to hundred equals one. But can that be? Mathematically, can that be? This should be 100, right? Mathematically, this should be 100. But what do you feel? This is one. This is just one camera. So either logical mathematics is wrong, or what we feel is wrong. Which one do you think? Do you think the logical mathematics, the things that we use to build things, or the feeling of this is to be one separate unit, be wrong? The only reason why we think this is one is because we doubt to realize this is cause and effect. Because Infinity plus infinity equals infinity. Infinite plus infinite equals infinite. What I mean by infinite, I mean these are causes. Causes, causes that come together to give them give you separate effects. Hmm? To give you something else that give, that's made from causes that give you the effect. For example, separate this camera from the lens, from the buttons. So keep the camera, but remove the causes. Can you do that? So you keep the, so another example here. Can you all see this table? Oh, no, another one. You're all sitting down, so those of you sat down on a seat, right? And that was uh, on the floor, right? But on the seat, right? Touch the chair without touching the legs, the backrest, or the actual, I don't know, what's this part called? The sitting part. Or touch, touch the chair without touching metal, plastic, or fabric. Or touch, uh, touch the cushion without touching the fabric without touching the stuffing? Can we? But we feel as though, okay, this camera is one fixed object. And therefore, because it's fixed, we think, okay, this has to work how I want. When I press the button, it should work. We fail to realize that there have been like thousands of thousands of causes to give you that fact. Because we felt what we don't, we, because we don't know, we don't understand the theory of cause and effect. We imagine this to be one and therefore, okay, I want this camera. I expect this camera to work, to zoom, 
I remember uh, I used to have a camera and, and, uh, and I used to have a sister as well. And a sister decides to drop the camera. And uh, she didn't tell me though. She dropped it, but didn't tell me. But I found out anyway. Uh, <laughs> she dropped it and uh, she left it just as it was, right? Made sure I didn't know, notice anything that has gone wrong and just left. I pick up the camera and it works as normal. Except you can't zoom. He has done something with the lens, I don't know. But when I picked up the camera, what, what feeling did I have? I felt as though, no, this is a fixed camera and it works. I, when I click the button, it should, it should take the photo. When I zoom, it should zoom. I felt to realize this is all cause and effect. And what did my sister do? Did she drop and break the camera? Or did she just change the course? What she did was she, she dropped it, therefore it changed the course. Therefore, the camera isn't working the way it isn't working the way that I expect. So my expectation does what to the world? My expectations does what to the world? Zero. For example, right? Come back to a football game, a soccer game, sorry. Let's say there are 100 people supporting Manchester and only two people supporting uh, Chelsea. If what we expect and if what we want makes a difference, shouldn't uh, Manchester always win? Because every because there's a hundred supporters and they all expect Manchester to win, right? And only two Chelsea supporters. So what's the what's the point of playing the game? What we can do is count how many supporters and go. Uh, there's fifty supporters here. There's three supporters here. Okay, <laughs> Manchester is going to win. But that's not how it works. Our expectations. The reason why we put our expectations. The reason why we want things. Is because we think it's we think it to be a one fixed object, a different unit. But really, infinity plus infinity equals infinity. Cause and effect plus cause and effect equals cause and effect. It's because we felt because of our ignorance that's hijacked our, our mind. We start to realize it's this, this cause and effect. Therefore, we think we start seeing fixed, separate units. And we start, we start to expect. We start to want. Now, if you really think about it, the things that we want, the things that make us happy, what do we do? Last time we talked about this, we said, we said, we put this sticker pointing this, it's mine. It's not mine. For example, your phone makes you happy, right? It's yours. Your house makes you happy, right? It's yours. You automatically build this feeling that this is mine. Okay. My next question. Prove to me that the t-shirt or shirt or blouse, whatever you're wearing, is yours. Prove it to me. So wait, am I talking to a girl? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say with me. <laughs> wait, so, so, wait, so you bought it and so it's yours, right? Yeah. Yeah. Technically, yes. Well, you give it away to someone. So now, is it still yours? No, it becomes theirs, yeah. How? Because you've given up the possession, you've given up the mind, the label, you think it's somewhere else. Okay, okay. So you, you remove this label and you give it to someone else. But then, can't I think that that t shirt's mine? For example, 
if a thief was to come into your house and, and take something of yours, they now think it's theirs, right? But is it? The proof in your t shirt's yours. Or well, I'm talking to a group of thieves there. I do not want to do that. <laughs> I can prove it. The legal title. <laughs> 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 think about it <laughs> you can't because this sticker that we place onto things actually it doesn't stick this sticker that we place on things and we say this is mine this is mine this is mine doesn't actually stick because you can't Nothing, you, you can't label something and say it's yours. For example, if I was to ask this teacher, excuse me, t-shirt, who do you belong to? What would the t-shirt say? <laughs> <laughs> Whoever wears me, wears me. I don't belong to anyone. <laughs> or obviously, speech, it would be like that, I don't know. <laughs> so, Wait, this t-shirt doesn't know who it belongs to. But yeah, we can say, okay, this t-shirt belongs to me. It's my t-shirt. But really, who does it belong to? Does it really belong to you? Or do you believe it belongs to you? So last time we talked about the sticker, right? We stick, we put a sticker of mine on first. This time I'm telling you, even though you try to stick it on, it didn't stick. You place an imaginary sticker thinking that's mine. Because can't you all now just think that this table is yours? You can't put it here. And so if I was to do something to the table, you can be very upset with that. Even though it's not yours. We place, we place this here that these stuff are mine. We separate them out and say, these stuff are mine, these stuff are yours. But that, that is something, that's a fallacy that the mind makes. The mind believes. Another example, right? How many, how many, you can't see words, right? But how many words do you think there are in Sydney? <laughs> really, if you think, really think about it, how many words are there actually? One word? Basically. If you really think about it, there's only one road. All roads are interconnected. But that's not what we feel. No, it's not saying that, okay, we should all name, we should all have one road. <laughs> <laughs> We should have a, we should name roads. That's the best thing because you can identify places. Battery one hundred percent. Give addresses to and stuff like that. L A P T O P and V six A U V I P. But, but, that's not what we feel. Though. We feel as though okay, uh, say uh, say uh, uh, say uh, 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 Griffin's Avenue. <laughs> 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 Like, it's a completely <laughs> separate <laughs> avenue to other roads. They say, they say, I say I live on the McDonald's lane. It's a lane like that, going to the map. <laughs> right? I live on that road, on that lane. This is my road. And this is then, if someone wants to do something to that road, I'll be unhappy. I'll be sad. I'll be angry. I'll be upset. But who decided that? No, McDonald's lane is only this big, it's this long, 100 meters long. Who decided? Okay, someone decided that. But we separate these lanes out and we say, no, no, these are complete separate roads. But they're actually one. Just like that, everything, we decided to separate things out and say, no, these stuff are mine. These stuff are mine. Those are yours. Don't take stuff of mine and I won't take stuff of yours. These are things that we replaced, well, this, this hijacker made us believe. 
We have to believe that these are all separate. These are my stuff. These are your stuff. And therefore, if you were to take something of mine, whoa, no, no, you can't take anything of mine. Stay to your side. For example, how many world, uh, how many countries do you, um, yeah, how many countries do you think there are in the world? But really, how many worlds are there? And how many worlds are there? How many countries are there? We think about it, just in one country. For example, let's say someone decides, you know what, they're pretty thirsty, right? They take a straw, they put it to the, to the, the sea, and decides to drink up the entire sea. <coughs> now, how big is Australia? How big is it now? How big is Africa? Can we say how big it is? How big is the United Kingdom? Now there's no sea. Can you even label it and say this is how it is? This is something, okay, again, we're not saying that we should all be one place, right? No, we should have names, right? Or else we won't be able to, to, to navigate through the world. But that's not what we feel. We feel as though we're separate. So if we said, okay, Sydney and say Brisbane, they feel as though two completely different places. Two completely different places. But really they're just one. Our because of our ignorance, it hijacks and we say it's separate. I live in Sydney. This is my country. This is my, my, my town, my city. Now no one can say anything to it. It's mine. Brisbane is yours. The Gold Coast is yours. But this is mine. This idea of separation. But really separation doesn't exist. Sydney and Brisbane are part of the same thing. But that's not what our mind likes. Our mind enjoys separating things and saying, no, no, no. This is my pen, this is your pen. This is this is red and this is blue. I like red, you like blue. And because of this, we're constantly, constantly suffering. Now, theory is good, of course. Yeah, we can be amazing, but how can we apply this? Well, we start off by pointing inside. Can you read that? You point inside and you say, you know what? The problem isn't out there. The problem's here. So if I read this, it says it's me, hi, I'm the problem. <laughs> because we because our natural instinct, because our mind is hijacked, we point out and we say, no 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 no. This is the problem here. It's because this person is being rude to me, I'm unhappy. It's because this person is shouting at me, I'm unhappy. It's because I don't have chocolate I'm unhappy. I'm unhappy. But really, it's inside. I'm the problem. The problems in power. Now that's the best part. Because the problems inside, we can solve it. Just imagine trying to solve, trying to change everything to the way you want it. You see a car that's broken. You say, "Okay, fix the car." Right? You see, you see a house that that's not clean. Say, clean the house. You walk past in the street and you see a person, you say, okay, I don't like the way you walk, change. I don't like the way you wear, you're wearing clothes, change. You can have change how many people? 7.8 billion people, so, okay, 7.8, you have change. How many cars? How many, how, how many ads do you think there are in this world? <laughs> so how many things do you have to change to be happy? One inside. First of all, you realize that you have to, whenever you come and face a problem, first of all, you, have, you point the finger inside and you show yourself this is the problem. That the problem's inside. Next, 
you look at the difference and check if this is a desire I have or if it's a duty. What part of it is desire and what part of it is duty? Now, I understand we're running out of time, unfortunately. But uh, like this is also a really topic, desire and duties. Like we get this model up so much. Sometimes we think our desires are our duties and therefore we do them without and think that you know what suffering is inevitable, we have to suffer. Sometimes we do the other way and we think duties are uh, somehow our duties are desires and we don't fulfill our duties. And therefore we are constantly, constantly uh, upset, sad. So desires and, and duties, if I if I was to put it simply, right? Desires we have to remove. Because desires is caused by the I want, and duties we have to do. As long as we're alive, we have duties. As long as we, as long as we, pretty much as long as you're alive, you have duties. There is no, there's no place, not a single person that is void of duties. You have duty to yourself. You have duty to your parents, to your friends, to your colleagues, to, you, to your, your city, to your town, to your world, to everyone, you have duties. And those we have to fulfill. But as long as you want to live in this world, it's going to happen. The desires are what for a minute. So you separate, you take the problem and you separate it. And you say, okay, this is desires and these are duties. I have to fulfill the duties and get rid of desires. Next you find the core problem. You look at the problem. So you point your finger inside. You separate your desire from duties, and you get the desire and you show yourself the core problem. Then, what and why do I want? You show yourself okay, that one thing is the problem here. So, what is it that I want? And why do I want it? And if you were to continuously Show yourself and look for the answer to this question. Or, or it's like a, it's like you built a, a castle of cards. This is the one card when you pull out, the entire castle collapses. If you were to solve this one question, your house, the car's house of suffering, will collapse. And then, oops, uh, and then we end up being happy no matter what. Do you have any questions? So, what's the answer to the last question? Are we? <laughs> Alright, so, <laughs> so the last question so what and why do I want? Right? So, what is it that you want? Well, we want, we want something that is fixed. We want something that is separate. So we have to show ourselves that, you know what, this is all cause and effect. That this is all cause and effect. That this is not separate. So, one. So, if you were to show yourselves that, that the thing is cause and effect, that's so from the causes that you get the effect. Now, we can't place this sticker, or this imaginary sticker of wanting, of oh, this mine. This is mine. I want this. Because our mind, because we, our mind constantly wants a fixed unit that is separate from everything else. So if we show, because if we show the mind the truth, the truth of the world, the fallacy of wanting would just shatter. So basically, show yourself the truth. Show yourself what is really happening. When you show yourself what really what's really happening, you can no longer want. Your ignorance is no longer there. No ignorance, no attachment. No attachment, no vexation, no, no pressure. No pressure, no, no sadness, no anger, no, no any negative fear. But then what I'm left with? Okay. Happy.
Now nothing in this world can change your state. That no matter what, you let it happen. That's what we call unconditional happiness. And that's what we will aim for. Is that a question? Okay. <laughs> um, and I think also what you were saying earlier is it also to do with feelings as well. So what we want is we want to be with pleasant feelings and sensations, and what we don't want is be, and, and what we want is to be away from unpleasant feelings and sensations. Is that that maybe part of it too? Yes, of course. Um, so. It's now 2.30. Yeah. So we, yeah, I know, absolutely. Um, and our next session was for meditation at three. So we've got a bit of time. So I was wondering, would you like to have um, some Q&A now before sure. we go into the meditation, or would you like to have a meditation? Uh, we'll have Q&A. Yeah, okay, fantastic. So those who are online, you may have seen my message already where I've asked you if you have any questions, or venerable, you just place it into the chat. And for those who are here in person, you there's some pieces of paper and pens as well, so you're welcome to write your questions in and just pass them along to me. And you can keep it anonymous. And of course, if you just want to ask the questions, the people online, you just have to unmute yourself. And the people who are here, you don't have to unmute yourself, you can actually just say it. So after the Q&A, we'll have a short break and then we will have meditation. Okay, so, Venable, can you explain unconditional happiness again? I didn't really understand it. Okay, so, uh, think of it like this. Unconditional, if we were to define what unconditional happiness was, uh, you could say, okay, unconditional, which means it is something that cannot be conditioned, meaning nothing can change it. For example, the happiness that we, we, we constantly search for is something that is conditioned. For example, let's say the soccer game, when the ball was to move, right, one side to the other, that conditioned that happiness. That can make you either happy or unhappy. It can make you scared of you. For example, let's say, and even something like fear, that's also a condition. Just imagine you're in, in, a, in a forest and you see an animal rampaging towards you. You'll be scared. Well, let's change the animal to a pillar. Now are you scared? So even fear is something that's conditioned. All, all this is, is very conditioned according to what you perceive, according to what you feel. Your happiness is, is conditioned. When we're talking about unconditioned, unconditional happiness, it's a happiness that is not conditioned. For example, uh, the, when you brought along a friend to the soccer game, no matter what, they're neutral. If you really think about it, no matter what, they're happy because someone scores, they're happy. Well, even though, say someone doesn't score, they're still happy. That happiness doesn't decrease, nor does it increase. It's a constant uh, line. So that is what we call unconditional happiness. Something that is doesn't have isn't conditioned by something uh, by anything. So how do we go from like states where sometimes we're happy and content to unconditional happiness? So if you really think about it, this unconditional happiness is with us already on the, on the bottom level. But on top of that, we build this, these layers, right? That make, make, with this ignorance and with this wanting and all of this, we build layers on top. Therefore, we see this fluctuation. Fluctuation of happy, sad, happy, sad, happy, sad, right? If you think about it, the fluctuation of the pressure. When pressure increases, we are sad, we're stressed, we're, we're anxious, and all this. When pressure decreases, we're happy, we're, we're excited, we're, and all these positive emotions. But if we were to get rid of those layers, we're left with this one. It's unconditional happiness. So how do we how do we get from normal to this? 
you have to get rid of this, this fluctuation of pressure. Where did pressure come from? Pressure came from I want. How do you, how do you get rid of I want? Get rid of the ignorance. Breaking ignorance means you break uh, the, the wanting. Breaking wanting, you break the pressure. You break the pressure, well, you've broken to the last level. Unconditional. Unconditional. So if you really think about it, we are baseline happy. It, it, it doesn't seem like that because of this wanting, but we're actually all baseline happy. Our natural, well, before the mind was hijacked, it was happy. But because of, because of the hijack, no. now we have all that, all this other. Thank you, Venerable. Some questions online. So this question comes in a few parts. So the first part of it is this. Is it wanting or craving that causes dissatisfaction or unhappiness? Should we try not to want anything? For example, um, or wanting to prevent climate change or wanting a peaceful world with happy beings, should we try not to want not such things? Okay, okay. That's when we come up to the interesting discussion about desires and duties. Now, this is when we have to separate these two out. The difference between desires and duties. Now, let's say, right, let's do some, 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 some more maths, right? Let's say, uh, let's say you're doing a job, right? For every hour you do, you work, you get paid a hundred dollars. You work a hundred hours. How much money do you get? How much? Ten thousand. Ten thousand. Does it work the other way though? Can you pay ten thousand and get one hundred hours back? Can you pay ten thousand and get a minute back? A second? A microsecond? A nanosecond? So. How valuable is your life? What value do you put it? It is priceless. You can't label a price onto it. Now, if I were saying you won the lottery, right, and you have one million dollars, because you know the value of money, you will now budget things. And you say, okay, I'm gonna spend this much for this, this much for this, this much for this, and I'll spend, uh, maybe I'll, I'll give this to charity, do this and this. Because you know the value of the money. You know that one thousand one million dollars is a lot. You can do so much. But we don't see our life like that. So if you and we can't go back in time can you and change things. So in your life, if you were if you um, say decided to spend say two hours doing something that two hours you can't get back so it's our duty to give that two hours a hundred percent maximum effort you can't give 80 and come back that's our that's our duty to give 100 percent now let's say uh so say you spend 40 hours a week working that 40 hours you give your 100 percent effort your absolute 100 percent effort that's your duty now, if that gives you, say, a promotion, that gives you a promotion. You're not working to promote, you're, to get the promotion. You're working to, because that's your duty. So, again, something like climate change and all this, right? We have a duty towards the world. What we can do is we can't change effects. What we can do is change the causes. So we change the causes that we can, and if that changes the effect, that changes the effect. But if we if we want, you know what, uh, I want climate change to, to go. Now that causes suffering. That causes uh, anger. That causes uh, all, all these negative emotions because you want. But because you live in the world, you have a duty towards the world. So what you do is you give it the causes. Maybe if you maybe uh, well number one you start with yourself. Before you do anything, you have to first change inside. 
and then you can change the output. So, again, you can see the difference between duties and responsibilities. A good, a good question would be, let's say you have $20, and you've decided with this $20, you're going to spend it buying new shoes. One shoe pair is $18. Or let's say one shoe, shoe pair is $15. One shoe pair is $25. And say another street fair is seven fifty. What is your desire and what is your responsibility? Is your desire for twenty five? Or what's your what do you guys think? Which one is desired? So you have twenty dollars, one street fair is twenty five, one street fair is fifteen, and the other one is seven fifty. Which one, is, which one is desire and which one is responsibility? In the desire with the 25 one is that you can't actually, you can't get it with 20, so it'll be the desire. Okay. In the duty, I suppose, it'll be the cheaper one. <laughs> actually, if you really think about it, you desire can work on each and every three of those. Some people desire the maximum, some people desire, desire more. $15, that's okay. Some people will desire the $7.50. Desire can work on either, three of, either one of these. But your responsibility, your responsibility isn't actually to buy the cheapest one. That is not responsibility. But neither is your, is, your, is your responsibility to try to buy the $25 one. Or the $20 one. It depends on your reasoning. Some, some always say, okay, Say the twenty, the, say the fifteen dollar one is more durable, comfortable than seven dollar fifty. So it will be my responsibility to give my body the comfort. So I'll buy that. Someone may say, "Well, I buy a seven dollar fifty because if I save, I may be able to buy something else that I need." So that will be their responsibility. So we can't say, so desire can be to either one of these. Responsibility will change. So again, we have a responsibility towards our body as well. So we can't say, okay, you know what, I'm going to live like, with zero comfort. Because your body needs comfort. If you don't feed your body, you're going to die. You need, the good, you need nutrition. Does that, mean, does that mean you need pizza? Does that mean you need burgers, or, or does that mean you need to eat, say, a salad? You can desire eat any one of these, but your responsibility to give your body the correct amount of nutrition. Your responsibility towards your body. So, you, so when you face a problem. There's a, there is a clear difference between duties and responsibilities. But to, to, there's a like fine line. What we need to do is find that fine line and separate these two out. For example, let's say, uh, let's say parents, right? Their responsibility is to give their children the maximum they possibly can. Help their children the maximum they possibly can. That's their responsibility. Does that mean I make, them, make them a doctor? or make them engineers. Those are desires. But you help them do as, as, as much as they possibly can. The max for their, help them put their maximum effort. And what they turn out to be, they turn out to be. That's their responsibility. Is it our responsibility to get 100% in exams? Our responsibility is to do the best we can. If that means you get 100%, 100%. If that means you get the best you possibly can do, is 75% and 10%. All we can do is give it the causes of study. Uh, give, uh, give yourself enough rest. And give the, the causes what the results will be, the results will be. So that's the difference between duties and responsibilities. Duties, uh, sorry, du the desires and responsibilities. We have to get rid of desires, but we have responsibilities. You cannot live without responsibilities. 
So even like you for me, I may not have responsibilities towards houses or towards things, but I have responsibilities towards people. So me talking to you guys is part of my responsibility. But if I desired and said, no, these people have to listen to what I say. You must do what they say. You all have to you all have to come on the path and, and find unconditional happiness. That's desire. But this is a duty. Because if you really think about it, even the Buddha, think about it. If you were to ask someone who, who, is, who has uh, say, an arahant or someone who has found some unconditional happiness, whether they want to sit on uh, a wooden hard chair or a comfortable chair, they'll most likely the comfortable chair. Not because they desire it, because it's comfortable. The body needs a bit of comfort. But if you're like, no, 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 no. No, no, that's not responsible. That's my desire. I desire this. To get rid of desire, you don't need to sit on that wooden chair. That's not getting rid of desire. Because desire is not only the object, desire is in the mind. So sit on that comfortable seat, but remove desire. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. And as a follow up question relevant to that is Is there a wholesome wanting? Is there such thing? Well, there's one more thing that we need to have, and that's to get rid of wanting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or else you can't do anything with that. So that's the, that's, uh, you could say, a wholesome wanting. Because without that, you can't like, go anywhere. It's like almost saying, uh, you have to cross the river, like it's a, it's, a, it's a very deep river, but you're not allowed to swim, and you're not allowed to go and get on the boat. How are you going to do that? So that's the one wanting, but even this wanting, what we have to understand is, okay, I have to get rid of wanting, but what can I do about that? All I can do is supply the correct causes. When that disappears, it disappears. When that is eradicated, it's eradicated. But until then, what I do is supply the causes. So, listening to sound. Uh, meditating, meeting teachers, uh, discussing with them, and you will continuously accumulate the causes. You do the causes in all, and also like merits, good deeds. Those are essential, absolutely essential. Without these, it's like uh, trying to drive a car without petrol. You can get into, I don't know, a limousine. But then if it doesn't have petrol, well, you're not going anywhere. So merits and good deeds are essential. Right? So, so you need, and also, you need a direction where you're going to go. When you get in the car, you don't know where you're going. Well, it's not getting the car. So that's a wholesome desire for you. Thank you so much, Venable. So that's all the questions we've got at the moment. So uh, before we move into the meditation, and I just want to say thank you. That was a great session. I think if all of us really enjoyed it. It was very relevant. Um, I mean, the fact that you can include a Taylor Swift quote into that that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll we'll just have a short break, if that's all right. Maybe just let everyone here, especially and those online, maybe stand up, move your body around, get yourself ready because uh, Venerable will be leading us in a guided vipassana meditation after this. So come back in a few minutes. So we'll start and the meditation will go for about half an hour. Yes, thank you. Okay, we'll be back soon.